first thought, I want you to consider this. Men and women were not created to be alone. We are not created to be alone. We are created to be together. What was the first crisis in the Bible? Adam's sin, right? No. It is good that, it is good that, it is good that, that is good. I made this, this is good, this is good. Uh-oh, it is not good. Something's not right. The first crisis in the Bible was that Adam was alone. It's not a sin. The first crisis in the Bible was that Adam was alone. And so what did God do? He made for him a, a woman, or a helpmate, or a partner, a buddy, a pal, whatever you want to call him. It wasn't good that Adam was alone. And it's not good that Eve would be alone either. Do we just say that? It's not good that we find ourselves alone. Because as weird as it sounds, we are really best when we are in community. We really are best when we are in community. Look at what the text says, what we read. It says, each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. So put your name in each part. Rob gets his meaning from being part of the body as a whole, not the other way around. Patrick gets his value from being part of the body, not the other way around. I find value by being a part of this family, not the other way around. You're not finding value because I'm here. I find value because I'm here. Do you understand the difference? And the perspective is that we think that you know we're going to be a part of some church somewhere. We're going to be all the cats in the owl. It don't work that way. You get value because of the group you've associated with, not the other way around. All right? Now look at what it says. You and I are more efficient when we're effective when we're with other people. When we cooperate, when we work together, we can do great things. Like send a billion Bibles around the world. Okay? That's a perfect example. I can't do that. I don't have those kind of resources, but I can help Eddie, who helps the Gideons, do what they do. Those people that came to Christ, somebody gave that dollar forty. Somebody gave that five bucks. So that person is in the chain responsible for those folks coming to Christ. You and I can accomplish great things working together. The old saying is that the sum of its parts is greater than the one part itself. And you and I, in terms of math, our lives are the sum of all the decisions we've made. That's where we've added up to today. Right? So you and I, if we work together, I can bring my two pieces, you can bring your three pieces, somebody else can bring twelve pieces, some people bring half a piece. But you know what? When we put it together, we get a lot done. It's the old stone soup story. You ever heard that story? Neighborhood hanging around, they're all kind of hungry. They find this kid, and he's got a bucket, and he's got it over the fire, and he throws a rock in it. Somebody says, what are you making? And he's stirring, and he says, I'm making stone soup. What's it taste like? Oh, it tastes fantastic. Really? I got something I can throw in there. Somebody throws in carrots. Somebody else throws in celery. Somebody else throws in tomatoes. Somebody throws in some meat. And pretty soon, we got real soup. But the whole time, the kid's just stirring stone soup. Well, some people bring stones, and some people bring carrots. But after a while, you get soup. So what's your part? What's your part? The more people, meaning numerically, the more people who accept the responsibility, the more successful we will become. Responsibility means the ability to respond. Response. Ability. It's the ability to respond. And the more people here that will pick up their piece and run with it, the more we can accomplish as a church. But we need people to be responsible. Second thought I'd like for you to consider. Being part of a family means you accept responsibility. Okay, uh, those of you that are breadwinners, where are the breadwinners? How many of you work? Okay, if you decide not to go to work, they'll let you, right? I mean, you don't have to go to work, right? They'll find somebody to do your job, but they'll let you stay home if you want to. Now, if you stay home enough, there are people who will want your house or your car. They're called Bill. They come every month. Little envelopes. You, you don't have to go, but if you want a car, you've got to pay for a car. And if you want a house, you've got to pay for a house. But you don't have to work. You can be homeless. They'll let you. Okay? And this is the thing that we... We, we struggle with our children. And I'll give you an example. My children, um, my daughter one time wanted a horse. One time, wanted a horse. And I said, why would I have a horse when you can't feed the dog? <laughs> you know, we're talking about a 2,000 pound animal that makes a whole lot of mess. Why am I going to buy you a horse? You can't take care of the dog. Okay? And here's the thing that students, those
those of you that are like 14, 15, 16, you need to hear me out now. I want you to listen. The car keys are attached to the dog. The car keys are attached to the dog dish. Okay? And if we can't trust you with the dog, we're not going to hand you the keys to the $16,000, 5,000-pound Buick that can kill you and other people. It just ain't going to happen. Come on, somebody help me. I'm not lying. That's the truth. And we've got to tell our kids, look, this is the deal. You're earning your way. You're proving you can be responsible. Why do we have curfew? It's because people are irresponsible. It's not because we don't like our kids. It's because the world's full of idiots. And we don't want you out there with the idiots. Right? And if a child can be uh, 17, senior in high school, and they have a part-time job, and they can go here and go there and be with their friends, be on time, and maintain their grades, what do we say they are? Responsible. Because being 18 doesn't make you an adult. It just makes you 18. Because there are 50-year-old people that are irresponsible that still aren't adults. Oh, man. Okay. It's not like I'm running for office. All right. Here's the point. We need you to be responsible. I, I, I spent some time with a Mennonite family, actually in Van Wert, Ohio. You, you know where I'm talking about. In northwest Ohio, Indiana, there are a lot of Amish Mennonite folks. And I hung out with this family. Their name was Yoder. Okay, good Mennonite name. And I hung out with them for about four days. I was doing some speaking at some schools around there, and they had me stay with these people. And I watched these people. Now, I don't know if you know much about the Amish and the Mennonite, but what they do is, you know, that they own, you know, 600 acres, and they farm a bunch of it, and they got, and then over here is mom and dad, and over here is mom-in-law and dad-in-law, and over here is my own son, and there's my daughter's family, and they all live in one little, uh, little area, right? And it's because they need each other. They have to have each other. Now, I have my own theory as to why their marriages last, and my theory is, if you're behind a horse for 12 hours plowing, and you're sitting on that plow, it don't matter what mama looks like, she looks better than the back of that horse. You are happy to see mama when you get home. All right, that's just my own theory. And that will be on YouTube by Tuesday. Okay, that's scary. That's just my theory. But I'm hanging out with this family, and I'm watching them. And I notice that certain kids have certain jobs. They would get up every morning, and one child's job was to go get eggs. Because they had to have eggs. And another kid's job was to take care of the cows that they have. And another kid did this. Another kid's, and there's a bunch of kids. I mean, it wasn't like they just had two. I, I think they had five. I think there were seven people. Well, the littlest one was five years old. And, and, I, and I look, and he's out in the garden. And he's walking. The garden's as big as a football field now. Okay, I mean, we're not talking about like you, you and I have with a little tomato plant or pepper plant. And this kid has his, has his little hat on, on his back, and he's walking the aisles of the garden like this. And he's in kindergarten, five years old. And I said to the sister, I said, what's his job? She said, his job is to weed the garden. And I said, a five-year-old. She goes, yes. And I said, um, what if he pulls up the plant that you, you grow? She laughed at me. She said, oh, he would never do that. And I said, why? She said, we've taught him better than that. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is a perfect example. This kid knows responsibility. Now, in their world, okay, you're sick. You can't go get the eggs today. I'll cover for you. But I'm not covering for you if you're lazy. Because we need eggs. Now go get me some eggs. They need each other. They live with the mentality, I'm not going to make it. I need you to do your part. And each person gets up going, if I don't get eggs, we're not having breakfast. The mindset is the, what the body of Christ should be. We need each other. And doggone it, I need to do my part. Because the other people are counting on me. The more we crave someone else's responsibility, the more stunted we will become. Now I want you to listen to this. We all have a job in the body of Christ. You don't want my job, and I don't want your job. 